Welcome back to the Anti-Meta Meta Club. This week's race C is one that we haven't seen since I believe GT Sport. We've got group ones at Monza and it's surprisingly a lot of fun. On top of that, I've got an Anti-Meta car and a couple other Anti-Meta options. Let's get into it. The Anti-Meta car of the week is the Toyota GR010 or GR010. I just call it the Grolo because it looks like an L instead of a one. Well, this car has a disadvantage in the corners, it has a massive advantage in the straights, so you can definitely hold off the meta car as well as pass pretty much anyone on any of the straights. In a top 100, absolutely dominated by the R18 with a few of the Bugatti VGTs, hilariously one at the very top, I was the only person to put the GR in the top 100. Barely squeaking in under 1 minute and 32 seconds, I did manage to get 73rd globally with this car. Since we're at Monza, you've got to really focus on your corner exits because almost every single corner is going to lead to a really massive straight. You're going to be going incredibly fast, so you know you've got to break incredibly early. Looking for the 150 meter board, you're going to break right as you get to it. Getting yourself quickly all the way down to first gear, trying to avoid the rev limiter. We're going to turn in after we get to the 50 meter board, and you'll notice I'm still at full break as I'm entering the corner. I want you to notice how much I'm cutting this curb and also the direction I'm going afterwards. As soon as I apex over that curb, I'm going to continue steering right and add a little bit of throttle trying to aim for the end of the green barrier in the distance right here. When I get to the beginning of this dark tire mark right here, I'm going to lift off the throttle. I added a little bit of brakes, but it's literally something like 2 or 3%. You don't even need the brakes if you time it right. You do have to be very gentle and do not hit that orange curb on the inside. When you get on the throttle here, it's going to be really easy to slide the tires. If you slide, you're going to lose all your momentum, so you've got to do whatever you can to not slide, and that's going to be extra tough with that slippery curb there on the outside. As you can see, we're in second gear, and if you find that your car is sliding, if your tires are sliding, make sure that you rev it all the way out until you're really ready to shift up to third gear. Don't shift early. After the 150 meter board is the end of a barrier and it's marked in a red orange color at that point, that's when we're going to break. I like to get all the way down to second gear, turn in at 50 and then immediately downshift to first gear and come off the brakes really quickly, allowing the car to turn in. You'll notice again that I'm using as much of this curb as I possibly can. My right tires are barely on the curb. Add as much throttle as you can while you're flat on the concrete and then aim just to the left of the next corner before turning in, lifting off the throttle barely and then getting back on the throttle, continuing to steer to avoid going in the sand. This car can continue steering in this corner really well, so you don't really have to worry about waiting to get on the throttle. As we set up for the next corner, you're going to look for the 50 meter board and when you pass all the way beyond it, that's when you want to hit the brakes and immediately start trail braking in. I did it just a little bit too early, so what you're going to see is I apex too early, then as I upshift to fourth, I add throttle a little bit too early before then squeezing on the throttle to get on the full throttle. You would do the exact same thing just a little bit later if you're looking to do it correctly. Of course you're looking to do it correctly. About a car length before the 50 meter board here, we're going to brake, immediately start trail braking in, and get down to third gear, trying to avoid the high part of the curb on the right. We just barely want to use the curbing here. Back up to fourth gear and steer gently as you get on the throttle. If you're steering too much as you go on this slippery part of the curb, you will slide out or go all the way into the sand. You do not want either of those things. Like with the last long full throttle straight, you do not need to shift up to seventh gear before you hit the brakes for this next braking zone. These number boards come up fast, so just remember it's the second bridge that you see and you're going to break right after that. Right after you pass this access road to the right, that is your braking zone. Immediately get yourself down to third gear and turn in at the 50 meter board. You can use a lot more of the curb than I actually did here. You can see that I'm fully on the throttle right here, but I didn't get quite as much rotation as I should. If you wait long enough in third gear, you can then shift up to fourth gear and not have to lift again until you're all the way out of the Ascari section. Since I got on the throttle too early, you're going to see I'm using a lot of the curb and then I have to come off the throttle as I shift up to fourth gear. Then I have to come off again to exit, though I didn't have to come off that much and I was still able to get on the curb. If I waited longer to get on the throttle after the first corner, then I wouldn't have to lift for the final corner in the Ascari chicane. A quick note as we enter the final corner, this car does not like to turn much while you're on the brakes, so make sure you get off the brakes as quickly as you can. As soon as you pass the 100 meter board on the left, you're going to brake, get yourself all the way down to third gear, and instead of looking for the 50 meter board, you're going to look for the orange mark on the barrier on the inside. That is when we start to turn in. Trail braking in like normal, we're actually going to come off the brakes entirely earlier than you usually would, and then use the active steering in even more to continue decelerating the car. Once you hit the apex in fourth gear, you're going to get back on that throttle, making sure you don't steer too little or too much. And as long as you don't induce understeer, you should be totally fine, and it should be a straight shot all the way to the end. 
There are two main mistakes that I made on this specific lap, and I think it cost me as much as potentially three tenths, but probably only two tenths. Where I see a lot of people make a mistake is they continue decelerating beyond the first apex. As soon as you get on that line, you want to get back on that throttle and squeeze as much time on the throttle as you can between the two corners. Barring all other mistakes, the most important thing is to focus on getting traction out of the exit and getting on that throttle as early as you can, getting on full throttle as early as you can. This car really frees up the front tires when you come entirely off the brakes, so you need to do whatever you can to get off the brakes as soon as you can. So using the downshift, using the comp compression braking is really helpful. I messed up this corner really bad because I turned in too early. You want to do essentially the exact same thing, except you don't want to get on that throttle then come off. You want to get on the throttle just once and that's after you hit the apex. This one wasn't that bad. It's really easy to mess up the second Lesmo. Make sure you're not sliding the car whatsoever and you should be fine. If you use the first corner, the first curb, a little bit more than I did, you should get the car to rotate more, then you can get on that throttle really solidly. You should be to the left as you enter the right-hander, and then you don't have to get off the throttle like I had to on that last corner. You should also be able to carry more speed through the whole thing, which, of course, is important. Like I mentioned in the breakdown, this car will continue decelerating once you're off the brakes and you're turning in because it has so much downforce. So consider the last part where you're steering in towards the apex, part of your deceleration and it might make it a little bit easier to visualize what you need to do. There aren't a lot of corners here which actually makes it much tougher so good luck. In what appears to be kind of a new pattern that we're seeing, this race features a single tire compound, a required pit stop, and the option to change tires if you want to or not. However, the main cars are not going to be viable if you don't take tires so that leaves just a pit window as your option for when to pit. I would suggest lap five or six, but of course, if you really want to make something happen and you believe that you're being held up by traffic, you can choose to extend either stint by one. You could pin on lap four or you can pin on lap seven. You're really going to have to make that decision based on who's around you and what you think you're capable of with the car that you got. Also of note that this is the second time that we've gotten high downforce cars within the past few weeks with custom slip. The last time we had it was the group two cars at Suzuka and they didn't change it to custom slip until after the first day and it really transformed the race. You can definitely tell that we've got custom slip this time because even though there is dirty air, it's not nearly as bad. As you probably know if you're watching this, slipstream and dirty air go hand in hand. The hole that the cars in front punch through the air can allow you to have less air resistance when you're in the straight. However, it will disturb the air that goes over all of your aerodynamics when you're around the corners, making them less effective. Also of note, if you are a sim racer, you're probably hyper aware of how incredibly dangerous Monza T1 is. And even though we survived there, there's also the second chicane and the fact that I'm in a car that has a much higher top speed and much lower cornering abilities than the rest of the cars I'm surrounded by. This will play a huge factor in how you race the other cars. The Metacar is known for having incredible acceleration and incredible cornering capabilities. The cornering capabilities will be diminished a little bit if they're behind you, and even though it can accelerate faster than you, it's not going to be that much faster, and if you corner better, it's going to really nullify it because this car can pass the Metacar on any of the straights. In many iterations of the Group 1 races, you've got to really worry about managing your hybrid power, your battery power for the electric motors that power at least part of the hybrid cars. I'm not actually sure if something changed under the last physics iteration or not, but it appears that almost none of the cars really suffer from losing out on hybrid power in any of the races. What happens on this corner is a really cool example of exactly how different these cars are. You can see that Damien was able to break a lot deeper in there, he carried a lot more corner speed, but as soon as the corner is over, I'm gone. Another car that's actually very similar to this car and how it performs against the Metacar is the Mazda LM55. The Bugatti also seems like it could be really good. As you can see, or as you did see on the leaderboard, it's actually in first place and there are a few of them in the top 100, but it is a little bit harder to drive and I did not see anyone do really well. Now you can see our buddy Damien is being an absolute sweetheart right there. I don't know if he realizes that I actually completely screwed up that corner before he touched me. You might have noticed that as I went over the first corner, I got oversteer and then Damien just barely touched me. I think he thought it was his fault and it absolutely was not. It's actually my fault that he took any kind of damage or lost time, but of course he's a sweetheart and on top of that, he doesn't really need any kind of help to beat me in this race. Another part of the strategy that I talk about pretty frequently in these videos is having knowledge of the people you race with 
and also building rapport with various people. Damien's our buddy, and we also know that Damien is one of the very fastest Gran Turismo drivers in the world, so despite the fact that I do have the ability to pass him, he's going to be much faster in the corners, so if I can give him a little boost on the straights and then use his slipstream and potentially do that again, I could possibly run away from Dino, who is another one of the world's fastest Gran Turismo drivers and is within slipstream range right behind me. Jumping forward just a little bit, I do have to admit that despite the fact that this is a good anti-meta car, if you take the same driver in the anti-meta car and the meta car, the meta car is unfortunately going to be better. However, of course, anything can happen in these races, and if your strategy ends up being superior because of luck or just because of pure strategical thinking, then you might end up being able to beat one of those guys. And this is kind of the reality of we have to face when we like to drive the anti-meta cars. You might also end up in a situation where the fastest guy on track unfortunately spins and then you get a free position. Sorry Damien, I didn't necessarily want to show that to just focus on you spinning. In fact, if you watch my stream back, you can watch Damien absolutely break my ankles multiple times in multiple races today. So Damien, you've had your revenge on me, your prevenge, because of course that happened first. I apologize for showing that. It's, it's just part of the narrative, don't be mad at me. Our friend Andre is also in the Genesis, which I initially thought would be the anti-meta car. It is so insanely fast, just hilariously fast, but it does not like to corner, so it's not really a viable option. If you're feeling like just memeing around and having fun with the car, it is really hilarious being able to pass absolutely everyone on the straights, but then of course, the corners are really scary in that thing. With nothing but clean air for the next three laps, we're gonna jump forward, and I actually wanna show this part because I accidentally did stack dirty here, and I wanted to apologize to him again. I already apologized to him in the actual race, but I felt so bad about this. I did not mean to dive on him, I just braked too late. He saw that and thought that I was going for a pass, so he moved out of the way, and unfortunately, when he moved out of the way, another driver who wasn't really careful ran into him, and he ended up spinning. So, Stag, thank you very much for giving me space. I'm so sorry, I did not mean to dive on you, and, yeah, that doesn't feel good, but now we're up here. We're in 10th place currently, but I think that just means someone else has to pit. So we'll jump ahead again and we'll see where we are when other people have pit. Jumping forward to the end of the next lap, actually the beginning of lap eight, and you can see just as predicted, we are in fourth place comfortably with our friend La Maravilla right behind. I've been informed that his name is probably not Lamar. I've been calling him Lamar. I thought his name was Lamar Avia, but I believe his name actually means the wonder in Spanish. Any Spanish speaking people can correct, correct me here. I believe it's La Maravilla and I really like him. He's a very fast driver and he tends to help me out a lot. Of course, he's helping himself out, but he's really kind. He pushes me and he doesn't give me a hard time until the very end and then we can, we can race it out, which is a really good strategy when you can team up with another fast driver. But either way, he's always really kind, really fair, and he's a quick driver. So big shout out to him. Jumping forward all the way to lap 10, we have somehow managed to catch Slayers and the rest of the other people in the meta cars. And I didn't realize it yet, but things were about to go down. Now, you can see that those two made a connection. Myth Mike and Carson Racing. I have to say, Myth Mike is always clean with me. And Carson, I watched him run into about five or six different people today. So I think I know whose fault that really was. Now, because of all that happening, on top of the fact that my car has much higher top speed, I was able to go three wide in that straight and get all the way in front of Slayers, who then got in front of me, of course, because he has much better cornering capabilities. Did you know you can go all the way in the dirty part of the track right here without any kind of dirty tires going to the next corner? That is a trick that a lot of people use in the competitive world. Anyways, we got all the way ahead of Slayers, and it looked like we were going to be able, be able to maintain our first place position. I just had to maintain this position in front of our friend Slayers for an entire lap, which, of course, is easier said than done. Slayers is a very, very fast driver. You've probably seen him on the leaderboards, or if you watch any of my streams, you probably are very familiar with him. He's a sweetheart. I absolutely love him. He helps me out a lot with the anti-meta cars and just strategy for racing in general. Absolutely wonderful guy. Please check him out on Twitch. He streams many days per week. And like I said, he's very fast, very handsome. Absolute sweet guy. Sweet guy. I said sweet guy. I've recorded for so long that if I had to delete all of that, I would lose my mind. So despite the fact that I made a really hilarious speaking mistake, we're going to keep it in. Now, I'm not always one to foreshadow in these races, but if you thought this was going too well, you might be onto something. It's funny that I said that right before Ascari, because you could probably assume that I'd make a big mistake at Ascari, but I, I did not make a huge mistake at Ascari. I was just kind of slow, and I maintained the inside, thinking that I didn't really have anything to worry about, and I'd be able to pull away from Slayers, but that 
is where I went wrong. I went wide, took the normal line, forgetting that the R18 can break so incredibly deep that Slayer's got all the way in front of me. Now, this car does have that acceleration, and Slayer's did move over just in case we got ourselves almost a photo finish. Slayer's had that. That dive was clean. That was amazing. I can't be mad. And despite the fact that we did lose to the Metacar here, if I defended on the inside, I think I would have been able to hold out Slayer's. That was just a strategic and driving mistake on my my part, but it was a lot of fun. If I'm going to lose to anyone, I like the fact that it's Slayer's with Lamar Maravilla right behind us. That was a great, great race. Now, you might have seen Damien turn all the way around completely slide out earlier on in the race you might notice that he is now in fifth place only four seconds behind because he has incredible pace shout out to damien too this was all just a really good race i'm really enjoying this this week a lot more than i thought and this is a really great anti-meta car as always thank you very much for watching if you like what you saw please don't forget to like and subscribe and of course i'll be making another one of these guides every single week i'm going to leave you with a look at my current members i love every single one of you guys thank you